Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're good. Hope you're having a nice Thursday. Welcome to Chewing It Over. I'm Jack Chew, 12.30 till 1 o'clock weekdays. We discuss all things uh, topical in and around MSK, be that sport rehab, but also whatever then touches the sort of cultural zeitgeist and, and our little space within it, which is involves yesterday's session, including sort of the gender tally between men and women in, in, in uh, a TAR Therapy Live event. But then this one, of course, we then switch to being a bit more clinical, which is nice. So we try and reach the whole, the, you know, whatever whatever is hot. And certainly on Friday, Ian Horsley's talk on rehabbing the shoulder for contact, we've heard from a lot of you who really enjoyed that session, particularly some of his concluding thoughts and ideas on on, on rehab. You can see that he just has so many, so many different um, op options there for, for those sorts of athletes. And so one of the things that was a shame is that we didn't have enough time to cover all of those questions. And so fortunately, we were able to then pull those questions and get to them today because Kindly has donated even more of his time uh, for us today. So hopefully within a few clicks, I can get Ian up and also start to go through some of those questions that we didn't get to on Friday. If you have any questions now though, then please do feed them in. We're not we're not rigidly going to chomp through those old ones. We can weave in some of your new ones as well. So if, if it's something from uh, what we discussed now or whether you saw that session, obviously it's available at physiomatters.com if you haven't already on, on catch up. Uh, but hopefully, let me just make sure we get a few clicks done. And uh, Ian, can you hear me? I can. Good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for thanks for joining us. Cracking session on, on Friday. Um we, you know, unfortunately couldn't get to all the questions that continue to keep coming in, but we, we can have a go at it now. First one I think would be smart for us to, to start with, if we can, is that there was a question in and around psychological outcome measures. So do you use any for shoulder injuries and, and do they help with readiness on return to sport? That was from Joe Govert. Yeah, you know, it, it's... It it is really important you know and it does often to get get forgotten and i know there's been a big push you know to the biopsychosocial side of managing any sort of musculoskeletal uh, injury now but it does get uh, forgotten about that that last bit about whether somebody is really mentally and psychologically ready and, and so that a nice um a scoring system you can use is the injury psychological readiness to return to sport which is the i dash p r r s and that's a six item scale measuring their psychological readiness yeah. and it scored from not to 100 so basically um if they get a, between 50 and 60 on the scoring then they are ready psychologically uh, to return to sport if they get less than than uh, 50 it's then it's deemed that they're not quite ready uh, to return to sport and obviously the higher the number the, the more confident they are and the lower the number the less confident uh, that they are and then along with that the, the i don't use as much is the tamper tamper scale of kinesiophobia which it's just assesses fear of movement but generally that will be uh, sort of early to mid stage really where we've got that that fear fear of movement uh, around around the shoulder because that you, you're going to get like a lot of context specificity there, aren't you, with regards to the contact? You know, someone might be moving and behaving, ADLs and sport fine, training fine, but they're not doing contact yet. Yeah. That that a TSK wouldn't necessarily capture that. No. Some of the specific measures that you just described, although not the catchiest acronym, yeah. but you, did, you did well. Yeah. I, would, <laughs> I would get it right if I tried. Yeah. Um, just out of interest, if we apply that clinically, then. Do you find that those that have got an underlying apprehension, your work and your PhD and since has, has been around this, this timing and mus muscle patterning for braced for contact, do they go early on that and end up being rigid too soon? Or do they just have avoidant behaviours where they change their game to avoid contact on that particular side? What are the typical cluster behaviours that you notice? Okay, so, so the answer is yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, so again, as I tried to talk about in, in my talk, that we, we know, you know at the point of impact, it's, you know, it's massive. Your whole body needs to be rigid, and certainly that EMG study shows that snugging of the, the ball into the socket, that needs to happen. But 
it's right until that last minute you need to be able to adjust your body because generally the person that you're tackling is going to be trying to avoid you. Uh, and from, from that position, you need to be able to to adjust to get yourself in, in the right position. You know, and, and a lot of the research, for, you know, from rugby shows that by getting your head in the wrong position around around the legs, getting your head on the wrong side, that leads not only to shoulder injuries but you know, to some serious neck neck injuries. The, the the other is yes that people you know uh, uh, avoid that. You know, they will try and. Um, set up a field position so that they force the player onto their other shoulder, which is often their weaker shoulder. Uh, and again, so they're, they're less uh, proficient at tackling on, on that, that shoulder. And generally, you know, within a, a game of rugby, you, you want to try and, you know, if you're certainly an outside player, you want to try and push them towards uh, the touchline so there's less room for them for, for them to go. And again, by pushing somebody the wrong way, it, it's not what your teammates are, are ready are ready for and then might cause some problems no that makes sense when you say it's a funny way that we use language isn't it so when you're saying about a weaker shoulder are you meaning like technique wise you know like yeah. i've got a weaker foot in, in to kick with or are you meaning that sometimes does that also mean it's it's weaker to test yeah. it's probably you know it's the less dominant so you know we tend to like you say we have a tendency of a, a foot to kick with we tend to have a, a a shoulder that we tend to choose as much as we can to to tackle with can't you? Yeah, no, that, that that does make sense. There was a question that was linked almost to that one. I think I'll just make sure I attribute it to the right people. Oh, I've just clicked the wrong button. Sorry, I've got my uh, my question script here. So both Uzo Ahioge and Hannah Llewellyn asked a question around has the force coupling uh, conversation become squeezed out by psychosocial influences. So we've kind of already gone there with psychosocial influences and it's something that you consider to be important and for the reasons you've talked about, we've just done, expanded on. But there was then a question as to whether or not those things have squeezed out some of the some of the stuff on force couplets. So your reflections yeah. on that generally as a topic, if we could. Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the biopsychosocial is big now, but you know, if you look at it, you know, we, we it's really unfashionable to think about that bio side, but it is important that the, the psych side is really big. But that, that social side, if you look at that, that social side, we don't really take much notice of that you know you've got to look at the social determinants of health which have massive influences on outcomes of, of, of people's uh, physical con condition uh, you know uh, sort of health uh, ethnicity you know uh, social status all those things which have been shown to have a bigger outcome uh, on um, on recovery from from MSK stuff than genetics even from there so I do think yeah you know that people we, we i think in, in physio we, we we're quick to get on a bandwagon and we're quick to chuck the baby out with the bathwater uh, from, from there so suddenly you know if you're thinking about treating tissue then you're wrong it's all about getting getting the brain and that yes you know that if, if somebody's got an injury they've got an injury and you can treat the bio side and you can you need to treat the the psych side side as well and a little bit certainly you know you've got to think about that that social side because that that the social impact of sport that have on people's lives and we th i think one of the things that and we've spoken about it on this show in a few different ways really is that it's it'd be remiss of us to pretend that you can uncouple any of those features from each other you know it's like why would why would social determinants of health not influence what you ask of your body and there'd be some biological consequence on that both physiologically and psychologically then where you end up putting yourself is that a social variable or is that something that was motivated by various hormonal factors that you could consider biological? It's a big yeah. melting yeah. pot, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and athletes, are no, athletes are no different. And they, it, from what you're saying, they will, that they will affect on-pitch behaviours as well as off-pitch behaviours. So that, that's, that seems fascinating to me. On the, more closely than on the biomechanics of, say, force coupling and stuff, do you, do you see that as being something you... That weighs heavy on your clinical reasoning with with patients. I think you know it. it, it we've got to think about. You know, I, I'm, I'm a you know big into movement and, and quality movement. You know, very much down. You know what Joanne Elphiston talks about about beautiful, effortless movement, and whether that's just you know, taking your arm out into abduction and above your head, or whether you are going into a rugby tackle. You know that it, it should look. You know it should look look easy for, from that and and for that beautiful effort that movement to happen it's sequence of timing making sure that the muscles fire at the the right degree at the right 
right time and, and you know and which then aligns that in around the shoulder we're looking at the scapula and humerus that they're in the right position because your you know your cuff is only as good as the position is of your scapula so we've got to think about about that and your scapula is only as good as the uh, the mobility of your you know of your thoracic spine and we you know we can go all the way down, down the chain with it really yeah no that makes sense do you uh, one of the questions that came in um takes us a slightly different angle asking after some of your your research aaron murdoch asks do the findings of devi et al hosley et al reflect asymptomatic injuries being picked up on mri with symptomatic injuries at a later date no so so, but, so certainly with our uh, with our study ours were patients that come into the clinic with uh, activity related shoulder pain so from, from rugby that interfered with playing and had not responded to rehab and so went on to have surgery so we they were already presenting with some shoulder pain and in the Davy paper they were a, a, a case series of rugby players who presented with anterior shoulder instability uh, and they they had a, an MR uh, an MR arthrogram as a workup prior to having anterior stabilization surgery so either Banca or Latige so from from those two studies, we can't say that the sort of there were occult injuries. That they had something, they had something there that that turned up at the at the clinic. Because so I think that's one of the things that's been interesting about our findings all over the body, really, on asymptomatic, asymptomatic MR studies. It's been a quite an easy thing for people. It costs a lot of money, yeah. but where people get hold of. A, a, an asymptomatic bunch of folk and then scan them and, and we then go aha look at this supposed pathology that doesn't hurt the caveat that sometimes we, we we need to not shy away from is are some of those or i mean it'd be funny if it was all of those but if are some of those just going to be latent problems particularly if you're asking interesting things of your body or are some of those going to be really relevant if you're in a particular sporting context a la contact what's your sort of hunch on that as obviously we're trying to get ahead of the data a bit i mean you know you've got to ultimately it's function and and, and how that that shoulder works doing whatever it does to give you you know um an example i i saw um uh, an international sportsman who had dislocated his shoulder 18 hours before he'd had a, an MR that showed he had um, he had a soft tissue bank heart, so anterior capsule off uh, off his glenoid, and uh, came in and had to make a decision about his ability to, to play. And he came into clinic and I could not move his shoulder. I tried, I went through a test and then I went through the apprehension and then I did a, got him into 1990 and did a PA on it from there, nothing, not a thing. No, no apprehension, no movement. We did two weeks of, of loading and challenging that, not not a thing with it. So ultimately, you know, it, it's about function. You know, I've got a, you know, several case studies of, of rugby players with horrible, horrible MRIs that we've not had to do anything with apart from rehab who have gone back to international rugby and never had a problem uh, with it. So it's put it into context, really. Mm. It's, just so, it's so surprising how some people can just look or judgment just they, they reorganize and compensate so efficiently that you couldn't tell them apart yet there are there are some others through no fault of theirs that that some quite minor structural disruptions can then throw off their sense of, of proprioception of which your drills are obviously great for and, and mixing open and closed chain you know you were you were you know such a there are a suite of exercises that I encourage people to have a little look at the end of, of Ian's presentation from the other day. It just really gave you some some cracking ideas. Um, what what I, I noticed that um, there was a couple of questions of, of this flavour, this one from Samuel Mason. With recent media attention focusing on concussion and dementia in rugby, do you think the discussion will also turn towards other playing-related injuries and related long-term disability? This was like a, almost like a public is there an is there room for the public health conversation to move on because there's some media attention elsewhere i think inevitably it will you know and, and i may be doing the, the the legal profession a disservice but you know you know where there's a blame there's a claim uh, and, and and i think that's always going you know always going to push you know, you, you, you know you're going to it's going to be pushed that way about somebody who've had a previous shoulder injury in a professional sport you know and later down their life you know that that they're, they're, they're disabled because let's say they've got grade three grade four oa changes in 
in in in the, in the joint. But 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 it, it's you know it's that informed consent of people going into sport. To, you know, know that you know that you know it, you are likely to to get injured. But you balance that again about sitting in your chair all day and just eating ice cream and watching telly, and that you could have a stroke or a heart attack from there. That that's your that's your choice, really. Absolutely. Yeah, I think. One of the things that um, I mean, it, it tickles me a little bit because, like, of course, I, I know of I know of you as being someone not just in sport and physio, but also being you know you're sport mad as a fan, you know, as 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 I am, and uh, we we met through our accountant, another sports mad <laughs> person. So some people are that way out, and I therefore use that as an example how sometimes it takes for moments, sometimes tragic moments, to try and move the move the attention a little bit. And obviously what happened with Christian Eriksen the other day means that you've got people doing to CPR teaching on Good Morning Britain and things like that. It sometimes catches attention. Does that, just out of interest as a medical professional in sport, do you find it frustrating that it takes for those events to bring it to people's attention? Or do you see it as being, right, let's rub his hands and just yeah. use it? I, you know, I, it, it's a great thing, you know. And you say it's a, you know, it's a, it's a good out for for Christian Eriksen from there, and it, and it raises that, you know, that that pro, profile. But it's like, you know, it's like anything. You, you get that peak around the time and, and interest, and everybody's into it and doing stuff. But over time, you get, you know, it almost regresses back back to to the mean until another, you know, we, uh, there's another tragedy or, or near tragedy that 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 goes on. So it's you know I suppose you look at it and think well you know there may be a few more people who who are better trained but I saw a really nice an interesting thing on social media the other day that was sort of having a go at sort of coaches and managers who who, who complain about the sort of the annually retentive physio and medical staff who want to have all the kit with the you know need the defib and they need the need the green bag with them and want it everywhere from there and they were saying you know so you know. If if they hadn't have had all the gear, then you know that that outcome with Christian, you know, could have been di- different. But it's unlike it at that level. But again, even at lower level, you know, even lower level down, it could have it could have still happened. You know, at, you know at junior stuff and the, the the you know the the availability of having these AEDs in public is is a massive, you know, is a massive thing. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, it's, a, it's a really good point. I think one of the things that I can so understand the frustration that it takes for sometimes tragic events like that for it to really capture the public's imagination. But that's not a good enough excuse to not try and take the opportunity when it's there. That's even the, that would be the worst of both worlds. Yeah. Be irritated, but then also not acting on it when it happened. Um, and I think that you know the fact that that should move, it should it should humble those that have otherwise been disgruntled about it. And it, you can extend that to like. Um, sometimes I, mean, I remember myself going to going to, to to the club purse strings in a semi pro rugby context and saying these these spl- these uh, these splints just won't do. You know, it was like that they they'd got um, something that wouldn't fit most of the athletes. You know, if you were trying to stabilize a limb and stuff, it's just that you know things like that that they then roll their eyes and think that you're being belt and two braces when realistically some of that low probability but high severity events do need to be protected for and especially on a workforce level that's exactly how you ruin any aspiring physio's career is that they encounter something like that that they weren't given the provisions or skill or training to 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 help with and they're not going back to work the next day they're like sod that i'll go and work in a shop i'm not paying (laughs) nearly enough for this sort of thing and i think that that's something that does get under undermined and 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 therefore if this event can can catalyze some of that and give some support for provisions uh, like you've described it i think that could be a that could be a really decent outcome so yeah it's yeah, a really, really good i agree point. yeah what what um one one thing that was was asked as well is as an athlete so this is from ed owen he said as an athlete begins to transition to squad training do you use any objective markers to gauge shoulder fatigue through a training week if yes how do you go about applying these markers to adapt your training? Okay, so obviously I'm quite biased. We we've published a couple of uh, papers on grip strength and what grip strength means. So we, we our original paper looked at uh, just grip strength uh, in three positions. So regular position with your arm by your side at 90 degrees elbow flexion. Then second position uh, elbow flexion 90 degrees, 90 degrees abduction. And then we went into that abduction external rotation position and we looked at correlating grip strength with uh, isometric external rotation force 
and and the results in all three positions between dominant and non-dominant arm were uh, very good to excellent. So that is a, what I use a lot as, as a monitoring tool for uh, fatigue, for, for re recovery, for um, uh, as part of training, but also you know during a training session, whether if they're doing a, a gym, upper body gym session, whether they've recovered enough to do the next set. So we'll look off for about a 12% mm -hmm. drop off in, in grip strength as say no that's meaningful you need to you need to come back from that yeah no, that's that's interesting and what, what i i know that athletes typically they are using their grip as a means of, of of training and a means of performing depending on their sport but if if you're you're doing your tests and then if someone was to train their grip overtly like they were they were to they take take a, take a dynamometer on with them and just train that yeah. over the course of a six-week period or something would that corrupt the data or is it still valid despite that no so so you you can use that as a training method for increasing your recruitment or your posterior cuff so it works both ways so you can go top down or, or bottom up so again if somebody's grip strength is down you can get them to to do uh, to, to do some uh, some um, sorry, if their posterior cuff uh, recruitment is down, you can get them doing grip strengthening, uh, and that will, some, uh, will often bring it back up to normal. Fascinating, right? Because I, I was, I was suppose I was concerned that if someone was to do that or was to take up something yeah. that was kind of more grip dominant, right? Someone then took up climbing and didn't yeah. happen to mention it, and then they they might end up washing out that that data. But actually, no, you're saying it would contribute uh, positively yeah. the other way. That's that's cool because that because. Um, you know, it's it's you need all the help you can get sometimes, especially if you're needing to nurse someone back. Yeah. Make retaining that activation, retaining that that baseline tone and stuff is is a is a really good thing. So so that's uh, that's brilliant. Any other questions that you guys have had, then please do post them in the chat wherever you might be listening to this. If you find us on LinkedIn, then you can find us on Twitter or Facebook if you prefer, and vice versa. This gets streamed to various different locations. But if you have any questions for Ian, then please sneak them in. I'm, I'm certainly not running out. Don't worry. I'm, I've always got 101 questions, and we've got a couple more even from the feed the other day. But just if anyone is tuning in live, I know most of you get this on your commutes and stuff for the next day but if you are tuning in live then please do let me know i'll get my, i'll get your questions to ian unless they all keep flooding in i'm afraid ian that happens when i've got a new guest on people then wait till like the last minute and then they <laughs> all the questions come at once and they blame me for it um so yeah but those those of you that are listening then do do uh throw us a throw us a question one that i had was around the the point of snugging is how how conscious is that process and how much of a skill is it something that you perceive that people need to train? Because there's a lot of, I hear it and I, I, I can so comprehend the mechanism and it so makes sense considering, you know, I'm, I'm a saddle that's read your PhD. Right, right. <laughs> so I kind of get the pattern in, but it's just that it reminds me sometimes of what we perceived at the trans abs for the back and stuff. It was like, we got carried away on that theme. How do we make sure that we don't in this direction? And what is the difference? So, so we used to, it's on the on the, the athletic shoulder course that Ben and I used to teach. We we used to have a session where we we taught taught that. So there's a there's a test um, that was uh, sort of developed by McGeary and Jones down in in in, Aust in Australia, looking at uh, this this snugging this activation. Uh, where you would um, you, you, at various levels, but the basic level is you'd get somebody in various degrees of flexion, and you'd see how they would respond to you. First of all, going pushing them into internal rotation, so you're looking at recruitment, the external rotation, and what you could sometimes find that at a certain position in their range, there'd be a delay. So you you just put a little bit of force, finger force, and it'd be a delay. And 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 then you go through the range and everything would be right and and that angle would tell you the angle that you needed to work their snugging at, and then you teach them to try and engage that and and you know what, it's so hard, especially with athletes because you know it, it, they they just want to use everything they want to retract it they right. want to use pecs and things and it, and if you can take the time and you either find your, your patients you're working with one or the other they're either getting it really quickly. Or it takes days to, to be able to just do that, just do that. And, and if we can train them to do that snug in there, and then we retest their their movement, which tends to be some sort of arc pain, that, that can change it. Yeah, because it's one of the 
because that, that that sounds like a fairly subtle lag. Like you'd need yeah. to make sure you practice that that test as well, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's a dynamic rotatory stability test. It's down. It was in manual therapy at the uh, twenty uh, two thousand and three or four or something like that. Oh, need, to, need to look that up. No, that's yeah. definitely an interesting one. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, you mentioned Joe Elphiston earlier, and it's just yeah. rung a bell for me that she she speaks about the fact that you've got different categories of body awareness, even amongst you know high end athletes. You know, you can sometimes make some assumptions over body awareness but it can sometimes be really limb specific or side yeah. to side or upper limb lower limb um do you find with rugby players in general if we were i mean i'm allowing you to generalize here but, yeah. do, do, do you find that you get the broad you know, the whole spectrum do you find that on average they are more body aware and can 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 uh, um vo you know, voluntarily recruit where you need to etc or or the opposite I, I think if i ever think back over my career it, it, it would be i i think that that on the whole, the majority of them are less less body aware because it, it, it's to, to to do rugby, to play rugby, the, the, the specific bits that you need to do it is not that precise, if you know what I mean. You're running into people and running past people and, and, and catching and passing uh, uh, with it. So they're, they're not used to that. Precise. There's a big, you know, the, the big about being fast, strong and hard so that high-end rec recruitment stuff and there's very little time put relatively put into that low low end recruitment and understanding movement so yeah i'll probably think that they're, they're less used to that that fine movement and, and being you know, body body aware i think and that and that does make sense you know gross versus fine in that in that context and you can imagine different positions it'd be a, a cracking cracking study you know if, if any of your phd students yeah. are uh, scratching their head then maybe if uh, yeah. if they could look at you know i'd love to know that answer on a few validated measures between say scrum halves and prop forwards as to what you know that the differences are there but also there's some data in america isn't there about the fact that they they study their quarterbacks to high heaven and they need a really interesting combination they need to be able to, 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 to take a hit but also the fine the fine motor of their overhead throws is obviously yeah. really delicate. So, um, yeah, Joe's working in sort of dancers and gymnasts and stuff. You can imagine that that body awareness and precision is slightly different to rugby. Yeah. But especially if we need to lesson, we need to learn lessons from that fine yeah. motor stuff in order to be competent and injury free in the gross motor from yeah. your work. So we've got to try and find a way to make that attractive to even the the brutes, I guess. Yeah. Um, which is which is which is interesting. What you mentioned about AC joint being something that is a continued vulnerability shall we say or yeah. common injury um sort of famously famously challenging um to to prognosticate against really you know your lower grade separations can be incredibly painful and and, and, and set someone back significantly and then other times all the other parameters seem similar yet it's something that they bounce back from really quickly. Yeah. Do we? Do, are we any closer on that? Is there any emergent work in that direction that you can point us to? There was a paper out relatively recently looking at the, you know, the, the, the radiographic grades that they use for grading AC joints don't often correlate with, uh, with, with function. Uh, so, so that had certainly loss of, of function. And then the, the other thing is that, um, again, if you think you've got somebody who's got a, you know, a minor, a, you know, grade one, two, definitely, and possibly a three, you, you can get, you know, you can get associated injuries that, that, are, that are a miss. So one of the ones that is often there is you get a, a slap tear, superior labral tear. So that then, again, starts to affect uh, motion, gives pain back. We, we you know, we, the other thing that it, it may be that you have managed to function quite well with your AC joint, but certainly, you know, and it's something I speak about a lot, it, it is having a, you know, a, a stiff, a hypomobile SC joint, so that other end of your clavicle is not moving, you know, and, and you need that to, that's the start of your upper upper limb kinetic chain. And if you haven't got the posterior rotation, there uh, amongst the the uh, inferior glider, the SC joint, then you're going to get more of a compensation there. So my first you know, my first look at anybody with an AC joint is always to start with their SC joint right. uh, and, and make sure that that's optimised. And, and it's amazing the change that you'll get subjectively with with your athlete. Yeah, I've I've got um one from rugby and one from falling off my my mountain board, but I've right. got two 
ACJ issues that are slightly different. And I've never had a bother with him until recently. One of my one of my kids had had slept on me, and I and I was like in a really awkward right. sort of scarf, like a. A, a scarf position plus I've, I've got my body weight across me yeah. for a few hours just what, letting them sleep on me anyway i didn't realize the consequences that it set me back a few weeks yeah. but it did remind me of the fact that 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 is a, an area both scj and acj where you can kind of get hold of it a bit better can't you and easier yeah. and you think about the fact that we've grown out of old antiquated mechanisms of effective manual therapy of the spine or pretending we can move the sij with us bare hands but at the sij at the s cj and acj it's yeah. like there is something to be said for sometimes giving them a bit of a wiggle i know i'm, I'm yeah. being really vague now but it's just like i felt that in myself yeah. that, be that for pain relief from from one of my, yeah. my colleagues uh kindly dishing that out but also just they, they just seem to be if you could conceive of actually influencing stiffness through through manual therapy that is a body part that it seems at least conceivable but i, I don't want to yeah. you know i don't yeah, no, i mean you know people who are you know don't like joints and mopes okay forget it as a joint just think about the bone in between think about the the clavicle all you need to do is a clavicle to posterior rotate yeah ultimately that's something happening at the ac joint the sc joint and you can see that you know and if that's not happening okay then you need to do do something about it so forget that you're doing joint mobs if you're uh, if you're not into that just think i'm doing bone mobs you know which you might <laughs> do tibial rotation mode yeah. mobs to uh, you know to, uh, external rotation tibial mobs to get extension better at your knee or or, or whatever i suppose it's it and, and also just laying mm -hmm. laying your hands as they're doing some sort of like shoulder girdle work that can start to get those things going but you know yeah. as i say a, a real personal anecdote yeah. from me recently that just reminded me of a, of a body part that hasn't hurt for a few years starting to again sometimes that just rekindles your your, your memory about some techniques that you might have otherwise parked so uh, we're out of time and, and okay. i'm so thankful uh for you coming on today to just unpack some of the other questions uh, just point people towards your your work and where they can find more about you so, so uh, I'm, I'm not a i'm a bit of a luddite but uh, social media wise i i, I am i'm on twitter at uh, at uh, back underscore in underscore action uh, mainly from from there uh and I, um, uh, I i pretty useful stuff on there i don't put my lunch on there but quite a lot of stuff about barnsley football club especially last season because we had a great season uh, from there and as i say and i am easily obtainable through the english institute of sport if anybody wants to to get out, uh, in touch with me Fantastic. Well, no, thank, thanks again for your time. Apologies to those of you. I've just had a couple of messages on WhatsApp from friends of mine saying that they were trying to post in the chat on a couple of platforms and it hasn't been working today. We have had that problem intermittently. I'll try and sort it out um, as best I can, but it wouldn't have been this week if we didn't have some form of tech problem. So I'm, I'm quite used to it. What it's meant is that me and Ian could have a, have a chat. I hope I've done you all proud and channeled some questions. Thank you to those that had commented and, and contributed at Therapy Live. And we will, I'll speak to you tomorrow on Chewing It Over for Friday is me going through some of the candidates that we're going to be supporting for the CSP nominations. So that's a slightly different chat from this clinical one. But there's a few people that we've been working with, um, partly uh, been on this show as well as supporting MSKR, that we're going to vouch for and get behind that we think would be brilliant assets to the CSP Council. So do tune into that if, you, if you're interested in that side of, uh, of our profession. Uh, but for me and Ian, for now, goodbye. Goodbye, thank you.